Well, thank you very much, uh, Christos, for that introduction. And I'd like to thank you and the organizers for inviting me to, uh, to, to speak here today. It's been a, it's been a, a truly a, a exciting uh, symposium so far. Uh, can we lower the lights a little bit? Uh, so Definitely, my mistake. Yeah. Just so we can. Yeah, that's, that's much better. OK, so uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, programming nanoscale structure using DNA based information. I always start my talk with this slide so that we're all on the same page, OK? Now, everybody in this room knows the DNA is the genetic material of all the organisms shown here, the plants, the animals, and the people. And for the rest of the hour, I want you to forget that, OK? We're not talking about DNA as genetic material. We're talking about DNA, the molecule, and the things we can do with it, and the information that it contains. Uh, this is the configuration of human bones with which we're all familiar. Uh, but if you do what Dovo the artist did here and strip the flesh from these bones, well, perhaps there's no really compelling reason to organize them in this fashion. So for example, this is a chandelier in the cemetery of the Capuchin Monastery in Rome. And if you look closely at it, you'll see that it too is made of bones, uh, in fact, the bones of the deceased members of that particular religious order. And uh, it sort of sets the theme for what we're going to talk about, taking a natural material and making an unnatural object from it. Now, uh, bones are fascinating, but we don't work with bones. We work with this molecule over here. Uh, DNA. Now, everybody who's been to kindergarten since about 1960 is familiar with this molecule. Uh, some of us in this room didn't quite make that cut, including myself. So let me uh, just review a few features of the molecule. Everybody, everybody I think, knows that DNA is a double helix. Uh, you might not be aware that the two strands have a chemical polarity and are actually oriented in opposite directions. So this pentagon is pointing down but the one opposite it is pointing up, uh, for example. DNA is a nanoscale object. Its uh, diameter is 20 angstroms, 2 nanometers, roughly. And its helical repeat is about 3 and a half nanometers. The spacing between uh, the base units along the helix axis direction is about 3.4 angstroms. Uh, this form with which we're most familiar is called B-DNA. By the way, this is a right-handed helix. If you look at the entrance to the room, you'll see that it was drawn in mirror image. Uh, and uh, the business end of DNA is not the backbone, really. It's these two sets of famous Watson-Crick base pairs, A, that hydrogen bonds uh, with T, so those are weak bonds, uh, with two hydrogen bonds, and G that pairs to C with three, so it's a little stronger base pair. Now, if I want to make something interesting out of DNA, uh, there's a problem with the uh, molecule I'm showing here, because the helix axis is linear. Now, when I say linear, I don't mean linear in the geometric sense of being a straight line. I mean linear in the topological sense of being unbranched, so that basically, when you tack lines together, what you make are longer lines. Since it's not entirely rigid, you know, you might make a good circle, that was mentioned yesterday, or on a good day, a knot or a cat name, but you can't make things that are really highly interesting, at least to me. So we have a solution to that, and what it is is the following. Uh, it, it's called reciprocal exchange, and I, I call it here, it, we, we stole this from biology, so I call it a biocleptic tool. And uh, it's, it's theoretical in the sense that we do it on paper. We don't actually do it in the laboratory. We do what the paper tells us to do. So to show you what I'm talking about here, here's a blue strand, here's a red strand. Following reciprocal exchange, I'll have a red, blue, and a blue, red strand. Now, if we look at that in the context of being a double helix, all right, here are two double helices. If I do that operation at this point and color the strands that I've done it to green, we start off over here, we cross over, and we go down to the other side. And the same thing with the other strand. Now, I did that over here between two strands whose polarity is the same. But remember, they're two different directions. So I can do it between strands whose polarity is not the same. If I do that, as I do on the bottom here, I go down like this, cross over, and come back up like that. And then the other one looks like this. Now, 
these two molecules are really just different shapes of exactly the same molecule. If I flip this uh, helix end for end, I'll get this structure. But uh, later, you'll see that if we do this operation more than once, we really create different topological species. Uh, an easier way to look at this molecule is shown over here. When you draw the four-stranded molecule as just like a crossroads in a, in a highway, and what I'm showing here are four different strands, the red one, the green one, the magenta, and the cyan. And if we put them together in this pot, they will associate to pre create this branch point, uh, which, which is key to well, everything we do. Uh, the, the algorithm for, by which we do this is uh, quite old now, over 30 years. And what, what we do basically is divide up every one of these strands into a series of overlapping uh, short elements, in this case tetramers. So each of these is a 16-mer, so that means we'd have 13 overlapping tetramers. And we insist that those each be unique, and we insist that those uh, going around a corner like this not have their Watson-Crick complement present. So you'll find no TCAG contiguously with the right polarity in this molecule. Meaning that, uh, and this is a very simple case, but we do this for more complicated molecules. This means that uh, each of these octamers is competing only with tetramers. So this ATG could, in principle, be over there. Uh, but uh, that isn't what, what we see happening in, uh, around uh, when we do the experiment. And uh, we also insist that there be no symmetry, uh, no twofold symmetry around the branch point that leads to instabilities. Uh, in addition to that forearm junction that we started studying because it's a, uh, an intermediate, or it's an analog of an intermediate in genetic recombination, you can make uh, branch junctions with more arms, five arms and six arms. And Yin Li Wang in the lab reported those in 1991. Eight arms and 12 arms even were reported by Xing Wang uh, about six years ago. But what I want to do is go back to the fall of 1980 uh, and tell you a little more detail of the story that Christo started telling when I went over to the campus pub to think about uh, the six arm junction. And when I walked into the bar, I was thinking about this thing as having this kind of snowflake six fold planar symmetry. Uh, but in fact, uh, while I was there, I thought of this. Uh, uh, woodcut of Escher's called, uh, called depth. And I realized that each of these fish was, in fact, uh, topologically similar, isomorphous with, with the six-arm junction. Starting in the middle is a head and a tail, and a top fin and a bottom fin, a right fin and, a, 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 and the fish and the left fin. But far more importantly to me at that instant was the fact that these guys are organized like the molecules in a molecular crystal, with periodic arrangement front to back, periodic top to bottom, periodic left and right. Now, the reason this was so interesting to me at the time was that I had been hired as a structural biologist, the, the current word for crystallographer. And I was, it was my job to do the crystal structures of various biological molecules. And by this point in my life, which was the start of my fourth of five probationary years, I had managed to crystallize nothing of any interest to myself or anybody else. And I was facing a sort of fatal progression of no crystals, no crystallography, no crystallographer. And, <laughs> and you know, it occurred to me that a scheme like this might save myself. I could align molecules using some kind of DNA-like interaction. So you know, although Escher was, was in charge of all the little pen strokes or whatever in, in this woodcut, in fact, uh, I needed to use a natural interaction. And the one that I, that I used was, you know, had already been used for extensively by genetic engineers. And this is sticky-ended cohesion. So here I've unwound a couple of double helices to show you a sequence. And this strand's a little longer than this one. This strand's a little longer than this one. So these overhangs are called sticky ends. If the overhangs themselves are complementary, then uh, these two uh, double helices will actually cohere to form a single unit. And if you want, if there's a phosphate on the five prime ends, you can actually ligate them to being covalent molecules. And uh, that's one half of the story of sticky ends. The other half is shown over here. This is a crystal structure that Hong Cha Chu in, la in our lab reported uh, a little over 15 years ago. And it consists of an infinite helix of uh, DNA within the crystal. It's, but it's got a repeat of, uh, of 10 nucleotides shown here, and then another 
like there, and this is the sticky end. This is what's holding it together. The important thing here is that the DNA over here, and the DNA over here, is absolutely identical to itself. This, this is upside down, of course, from that, because it's a half turn away. But basically, it's all the same B DNA structure that I showed you in that early slide. Uh, so that means that not only you know, do we know affinity, we know structure. We know, if we know the coordinates of these atoms, we know the coordinates of these atoms. I mean, we, we, in solution, we might not know them terribly far out, uh, say, outside of the building. But at least locally, we know what, where these atoms are going to be, so that we have both affinity and structure on a predictive basis when we work with things held together by sticky ended cohesion. Uh, so the, 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 what we've done here is basically combine these two notions, branch DNA and sticky ended cohesion. So here is a sticky end A and its complement A prime, B and its complement B prime. And here I'm just showing them come together to form this little quadrilateral uh, object here. But, so that's an object. But you can see there are a lot of sticky ends on the outside. So this can, in fact, form a lattice. And later I'll show you some nanomechanical devices we can also make. Uh, for our laboratory, the, the things that we want to do with this are basically architectural control and scaffolding, uh, attacking the macromolecular crystallization problem, and uh, uh, some aspects of DNA-based computation and nanoelectronics organization. For our devices, we're interested in nanorobotics and nanofabrication. I don't have time today to talk about self-replicable systems, which we're also working on. Uh, this just shows you know, what we're talking about with the crystallization problem. This is how all crystals are made. Uh, so what we do is we have to guess conditions, and we set up crystals. There's an optional step in the middle for those so inclined. And <laughs> then uh, we look to see if we have crystals. If the answer is yes, well, you can go off and do crystallography. Uh, if you go to my web page, uh, which I'll show you the URL of at the end, You'll see that this is actually the second version of this slide in the first version, which is there. I forgot that this branch existed. <laughs> and it's, it's so rare for us. So basically, then you, know, you have your choice. You can go through your, middle, uh, your inner loop here, or you can go back through uh, the outer loop here. But there's sort of minimal feedback from failure over here to knowing what to do the next time around. You know, it just didn't work. That's all you really know. Uh, so our suggestion is basically to make a box, and that's shown here in magenta, the box being DNA. Little things sticking out are sticky ends. And the idea is to have that box act as a host for macromolecular guests. We aren't quite at that stage yet for macromolecules, but I'll tell you about, uh, about how we do know how to make the boxes now. Uh, Makoto Fujita has recently reported on the small molecule scale being able to achieve our complete uh, goal here, but only for small molecules. Uh, another thing you can imagine doing is using this same type of system for organizing nanoelectronics. So here are the aqua things are DNA branch junctions. Pendant from them is something that would behave functionally as a molecular wire. And the idea is these things would be organized by the DNA. Uh, we and many, many other groups are now working uh, on this approach. Uh, why do we want to use DNA for this, given, you know, given, given these goals? And the short answer is that nucleic acid sequences can be programmed and synthesized, leading to an information-based structure dynamic and arguably catalytic chemistry. I'm not going to, this is my propaganda slide, and I'm not going to subject you to it. But by and large, the two key points here are predictable interactional intermolecular interactions uh, with sticky ends we discussed. And also, since about 1995, we've been able to design shapes by selecting sequences. We couldn't do that earlier. Uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind when you work with, the, with DNA is that the topology matters. It's not, it, it's not a problem. It's something that can actually be your friend, but you've got to be aware of it. So for example, here, these are slightly ver larger versions of that quadrilateral I showed you. And if you separate the vertices by two turns of DNA, an even number of half turns, then you get a chainmail-like structure. There's a red link, a red loop linked twice because it's two turns to a blue loop, to a red loop, to a blue loop, and so forth. Uh, if you switch that to a turn and a half, now you have uh, blue strands going this way and red strands going this way in an interwoven structure. You just have to keep the topology in mind when you work with it. Uh, do we have an intellectual goal here? Sure. Uh, and that's controlling the structure of matter in 3D to the highest extent possible to an old crystallographer like myself. That means the best resolution so as to understand the connection between the molecular and macroscopic scales. Feynman was well known for saying, you know, what I cannot create, I do not understand. 
But the inverse isn't necessarily true. We've made many things that we don't understand in our lab. Uh, so not, let me, with that introduction, let me just tell you about some of the things we, we've done. So we started off making polyhedral catenanes. This was in the era before we could control geometry. We could only control topology. Uh, and the first thing that was made was uh, by, made by Yang Hui Chen, a cube-like molecule, and then a truncated octahedron molecule made by Yulin Zhang. And then, again, both of these were strictly uh, topological constructions. We don't know their actual shapes. So the cube-like molecule had two turns from vertex to vertex. So this is like a chainmail thing. It's a, just a hexacatenane. The front face corresponds to the cyclic single uh, red strand here, and each face corresponds to some uh, cyclic strand. And the red strand is linked twice to the green, the cyan, the magenta, and the dark blue strands that flank it, and only indirectly linked to the yellow strand at the rear. Uh, using a solid support base methodology, Yuan Zhang, some years later, uh, made a truncated octahedron. This is a 14 catenane uh, of the same fundamental uh, notion. And, uh, and like, like that, we were unable to extend this to form the macromolecular zeolite structure that we'd hoped to make with it. So then we, we backed off a little bit from making more complex structures and trying to make simpler things that would be robust. Uh, this slide sh shows I, a slide I took some years after the slide in the Capuchin Man Monastery. Uh, this is in the catacombs in Paris. And you can see we have a really beautiful little 2D array here of the ends of, a, of, a, of six little femurs, and uh, these thigh bones. And we're now going to talk about making two-dimensional arrays to start with, you know, hopefully with the kind of, without the kind of defects that you can see on this particular slide. Uh, so we're going to construct two, uh, crystalline arrays. And if the components for that have to have predictable interactions and predictable local product structures we've discussed with the sticky ends. But the last thing they also have to have is structural integrity. That's a fancy way for saying that these molecules have to be sort of stiff and rigid. And this is not a bad dynamic structural model for a simple branch junction. It's a marshmallow that's in, been impaled by uncooked rotini. Okay? So the uncooked pasta are very, very stiff, but the marshmallow itself is floppy. So you, know, you don't have much control on the angles in between these guys. Uh, if you look closely at rotini in the Western Hemisphere, you see, in fact, that they're all right-handed double helices. In Europe, you can find them with both chiralities. Uh, to solve this problem, what we've done is go back to our motif generation protocol. And now we do two reciprocal exchanges instead of one. So we make something with two helix axes that are coplanar. And we can do that either uh, in the system where the, the strands that are exchanging have the same polarity or the opposite polarity. It turns out that these are much better behaved. So now uh, we, we're going to stay below this line here. Uh, you can see that, that they are different. There's four strands here, two reds, two blues. Here there are five strands, uh, uh, two reds, two, uh, sorry, two reds, two greens. Here two, two reds, two greens, and a blue in the middle. Uh, we can extend this as far as we want to make what we call TX molecules. These are DX molecules for double and triple and so forth uh, helices. Uh, the first thing that we did of this sort was 2D DX arrays. And we made, did, did this work with Eric Winfrey of Caltech. Frank Liu and Lisa Wensner in my lab did the following experiment, where they took two DX molecules, one of which had an extra feature on it, and put them together to form a two-dimensional lattice. So the sticky ends here are shown geometrically, so this complements that. This to here, this to there, and this to there. So you get a nice 2D lattice on paper. Uh, and this thing, this extra feature, is coming out of the screen at you. Uh, more importantly, it's coming out of this plane at the tip of an atomic force microscope, so you should see a stripe-like feature. And when you look in the AFM, you see this stripe-like feature. And, we, and I should mention that these guys are 16 nanometers in size, so the separation of the stripes should be 32 nanometers. You see something that's roughly 32 nanometers. If you uh, do a control experiment, you take four of these guys of the same uh, dimension, now we should see something like a 64 nanometer stripe. And indeed, we do when we look at this zoom. So those are, it's really nice to be able to make two-dimensional molecules. But what we really are interested in here in terms of making crystals is three-dimensional uh, crystals. Uh, and this is work that, that was done uh, and reported just a couple of years ago. Jianping Zheng uh, is actually in the audience, which is very, very nice. And uh, Jens Berktoff and Yi Chen 
uh, who was of Purdue and was a student of Cheng Dip Mao uh, from Purdue, who was Cheng Dip was my former student, and then Tong Wang, Ruji Shan, Pam Constantino were from my lab. Steve, Steve Janelle was from Argonne, and we collected the fraction data at SLS and at Argonne as well. Uh, so the motif that we used was originated by Cheng De, and it, this is a four-turn version of the molecule that, that he first made. And uh, it's kind of an over-under, over-under, over-under uh, DNA motif. It's pretty robust. And with that motif, we should expect to see rhombohedral symmetry, which we do. We can predict the cell edges, which we also, do, also see. But the resolution here is not so good. It's about 10 angstroms, and that's not really acceptable for x-ray uh, work. So uh, this just shows the motif. Uh, this is a picture that Cheng De took when he was out jogging one morning. Uh, and you can see it's over, under, over, under, and so forth. And uh, it, this was somewhere in the vicinity of Phoenix. Uh, Jen Ping figured out that we would probably do better on resolution if we shortened each of the different uh, edges of, of the triangles. And we also symmetrize them, so at this sticky end and this sticky end, this sticky end, they're the same. So this nick has been sort of, it's sort of a two-thirds of a nick in each of these three uh, positions. Uh, this is arguably the most exciting uh, slide for me that I've ever shown an audience, because these crystals are macroscopic. Okay? I don't know if you can see the scale bars in all of these guys, but it's the 200 microns. You can see these crystals with your naked eye. Uh, Oh, this is, of course, under a microscope. And we know where every atom is in these uh, crystals before we did the crystal structure. Uh, but however, I am an artist crystallographer, so we made an iodin a derivative of this thing and uh, determined the structure by uh, single anomalous dispersion methods. And this just shows the structure of the molecule. So this is in front of the screen, the plane of the screen behind, in front, in the plane behind, and so forth. Uh, this slide shows how all of the triangles are connected to each other through a sticky end at this position in the crystal. And uh, I should point out, this is about four angstrom data collected at uh, APS uh, in, in Oregon. It was five angstroms in, um, at NSLS. They have a more powerful source in Chicago. Uh, this shows the environment of a single one of these triangles. So that you can see that it's a kind of six connected lattice so we, ha we go from the rear in this red direction to the front, and from the rear in the green direction to the front, and the same in the yellow direction uh, in, in, in this case. So you can see how the, how the lattice is organized and that these three different directions do indeed span three space. Another selection of triangles shows that they, all of their centers can be placed at the vertices of a rhombohedron. So the red one is at the rear vertex of this rhombohedron. It's connected to three yellow triangles that are a little closer to each, to each us, to us. And then each of them is connected to these three green triangles that are closer to us. And we left out the other red one flanking the front uh, vertex. This is uh, uh, for just, just for clarity. Uh, this is a drawing by Dave Goodsell of that same arrangement, the far rear one, the three that are closer to us, the three closer to us yet. But now you can see it in the context of the uh, crystal structure. You can see how this arrangement goes on forever. Uh, this is a slide now getting somewhat old, but uh, it's the structure I just showed you was the one on the top uh, line here. But in fact, uh, we've been able to do this with uh, two turns, three turns, and four turns on each of the edges. And uh, we get predictable cell dimensions uh, in every case. And we get a cavity whose size is increasing as the edge length increases. But unfortunately, the resolution decreases as the edge lengths get longer. And we're working on that problem now. I'll show you some of our first uh, attempts at that uh, shortly. This is a, a movie just to show you, make, give, make you a little more at home with this motif. This is the four-turn uh, triangle uh, rather than the two-turn triangle. We've, I mean, we've done them all. And uh, this just uh, shows you how this thing how eight of these guys are able to come together to form the rhombohedron. There's the eighth one coming in and capping the arrangement. And uh, you, can, you can see how uh, this uh, structure uh, does, does fill uh, three space. And it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, polyhedron there. 
the other thing that should be clear here is these are eight triangles coming together to form a uh, rhombohedron, but in fact in the crystal we have 50 trillion of them coming together to form the macroscopic object. Uh, one of the nice things about being able to control the intermolecular interactions, to be able to self-assemble our crystals as opposed to simply putting them in a pot and hoping something comes out, is that we can control what's in there. So this is an example where we put two molecules in the uh, crystallographic repeat, work done by Tong Wong, Ruji Sha, Jens Berktov, Jinping, and uh, Cheng De Mao. And this shows the same rhombohedron where every edge is flanked by a red and a green uh, triangle rather than just triangles of the same flavor. So these are two different flavors of triangle. The red and the green are just arbitrary drawing colors. The space fling model is a little clearer, and you can see that it consists of two, that the rhombohedron consists of two intersecting uh, tetrahedra. The tetrahedra aren't regular because it's a rhombohedron, not a cube. Uh, Ruji Shaw was able to take advantage of these two different uh, types of molecules in the crystal and to, to color the crystal. So uh, he took a pink dye called CY3 and he attached it to the A molecule, the B molecule, or both. They got pink crystals. He took a blue dye and did the same thing, A molecule, B molecule, or both, and got a blue crystal. And then he attached in either order, A and B or B and A, to the molecules, and he was able to make a purple crystal. So we can actually control a macroscopic property of the, of the crystals by uh, just directly. Uh, now, we were able to get some nanocrystals uh, at, at LCLS down at Stanford here uh, to diffract a little better than four angst. And we, could, we were also able to do this work at, uh, do this at Brookhaven, but this just showed that we could do it in crystals that were not frozen, as most samples are. So this is done by Arun Chandrasekharan and Johan Ohayan. Uh, Ohayan and uh, Ilma Schlichting, Petra Fromm, and Henry Chapman were involved, and about 30 other people. It's a huge team of people whenever you collect uh, nanocrystal data down there. And this aqua circle, I don't know how well you can see it, is the four angstrom ring. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there are spots out here and so forth uh, in this case. And also, by changing the context, we were able to get down to three angstrom resolution in an SLS. So it was the same group of people, Nam Wynn, Jens, and Ruji were involved. And this is that 3.4 angstrom spacing uh, that I, I pointed out to you on the early DNA slide. And there are spots well beyond that ring. Uh, again, this is actually a double spot if you blow it up so you can see it. Another one out here. I think that, that may be an artifact. Uh, so, uh, if we shorten the sticky ends and uh, put phosphates on all of the uh, arms of the triangle, we can get to down to about three angstroms uh, uh, diffraction, uh, and we're working to do better, and we think we may know how to do that. Uh, let me t briefly talk to you about going from genes to machines, making nanomechanical uh, devices. Uh, the first devices that we made were shapeshifters. This is an example of shape shifting. This is Daphne turning herself into a laurel tree to escape the attentions over here of Apollo. Uh, but the first one was a BZ device made by Cheng De Mao a long time ago, back in the last century, in fact, uh, which consists of a DX molecule, another DX molecule. And they're joined by a shaft, shown in yellow here, of a DNA that is capable of undergoing a transition known as the BZ transition. That's a right-handed to left-handed DNA structure. Uh, we're not taking anything from the mirror planes. It's just a different conformation. And the way you trigger that is by the addition of cobalt hexamine. And so you can see that this yellow stuff looks different from that, which is conventional structure. Uh, what we have over here after that's happened is that this domain is now on the top of this long shaft rather than on the bottom. We could show that by a fret pair of dies. I don't like that device very much because it doesn't take advantage of the programmability of DNA, which I regard as its major strength. So Hao Yan, the lab, uh, built a sequence-dependent uh, device, and that was based on yet another motif that we should talk about. So now we're going to be on the upper half of this slide, and everywhere one of these points faces another point, there and there, there and there, there and there, there and there. We're going to perform a crossover operation. When we do that, we're going to make something called a PX molecule, a paranemic crossover. Uh, 
this is a better picture of Px. And what it looks like is a turn and a half of red double helix wrapped around a turn and a half of blue double helix. Uh, it's a little more subtle than that. If you look closely, you'll see there's actually pairs between these, uh, the reds and the blues in certain places. Uh, if we eliminate these crossovers, we get this structure we call Jx structure. And this gives us only a turn of structure. So these are the bases for the two uh, different structures. This is a turn and a half different, or a half turn different from this. And the way in which we convert them is we take the red strand and we break it and insert this green strand. And we take the blue strand, we break it and insert this strand. If we can get the uh, green strands out and put the yellow strands in, we can ship, switch uh, the, uh, the shapes and the states of these molecules. And this is a sequence-dependent area. We can make many different sequences there. So the, the way in which we do that is by a technique worked out by Bernie Yerke when he was at Bell. These little horizontal pieces of green or of yellow over here represent DNA that's simply sticking out into the solution about eight nucleotides that Bernie calls a toehold. If you throw in the complete complement to this green strand, including the toehold, it'll sit down over here and it'll branch migrate its way up to here and pull out the uh, green strand that's holding it together. It leaves you with a naked frame. You can put in the other guy, and you can just keep going around the clock like that. Uh, the way Howe showed this by AFM, so you could actually see it, was to take a series of these devices and use them to connect some trapezoidal half hexagons that he had lying around the drawer. And in the green strand state, they're all parallel. And in the yellow strand state, there's a zigzag structure here. And this just shows AFM of successive uh, cycles of parallel, zigzag, parallel, and zigzag. Uh, one other type of device I want to talk about is a walker. This is going to be a DNA walking biped designed and built by Bill Sherman in the lab. And it walks like an inchworm. So it has a little sidewalk it works on, walks on, which is a little TX molecule. And it can walk either this way or that way, but this foot is always go in front of this foot. But it walks both ways. And this is a movie just showing how it works. We're using the Yerke chemistry. It's held down on the sidewalk like that. We pull it out uh, and uh, put it in another strand. We'll just hold it down here after it's flopped around for a while. We release the hind leg. And we put this one also in over here. And it can walk in both directions. Uh, I want to, before I go on to sort of our, the final thing, this is a meeting of a symposium devoted to computer scientists. So I want to just mention a few of the things that happened in DNA based computation, which is related to what uh, we've, we've done in some respects. This area ex was experimentally initiated by Len Edelman's Hamiltonian path experiment almost 20 years ago now. And this just sort of shows. His, the experiment that he did. So I've, I've just taken cities around the globe, Quito, New York, Paris, Johannesburg, Ulaanbaatar, uh, Shanghai, and Melbourne. And uh, what's gonna, what we're going to do is we have a series, an incomplete series of routes between them. And this is how the Hamiltonian path problem is set up. And what we need to do is to be able to find an initial city uh, in this case, we're going to go from Quito to Shanghai. And we're going to do that uh, through this purple route. So actually, it, it, this turns out to be the right answer, going through the, the magenta route to Ulaanbaatar, down to Johannesburg, up to New York, Paris, Melbourne, and Shanghai. The way that Len did this experiment was to represent each city with a 20 mer of DNA. And each of these cities had a phosphate on its end, enabling the ligation reaction to occur. Each root was represented by the complement. So they, the first 10 nucleotides were, were sort of the first name of a city, and the last 10 nucleotides the last ones. So if the roots uh, were the complements to the last name of the first city and the uh, first name of the last city. So they were kind of catalysts. And they were holding these guys together, and then they could get ligated. So he tossed everything in a pot together, and uh, those phosphorylated cities and the catalysts, and then uh, he allowed ligation to take place. And then he just did a selection. The targets were all 140 mers, and so he ran the uh, 
products on a gel and just throw out everything that wasn't 140, more 140 more being seven cities times 20 nucleotides. Uh, he, the idea was to start in Kyoto and end in Shanghai, so he did the PCR reaction, with, which has primers, and he just used Kyoto and Shanghai as the primers for the complements of them. And then he just selected all the intermediate cities by uh, selecting for them on magnetic beads. Now, so this was an idea that you know, people got very excited about. It hasn't gone all that far in this direction. Another route that I think is ultimately going to be more potent uh, regarding uh, computation and logic and DNA is shown over here, which is an algorithmic assembly. This is a, a cumulative XOR calculation that was done by Chengdu Mao uh, from my lab, uh, Tom Levine and John Reif at Duke. And just to introduce this, these are Wang tiles. Most of this audience is probably more familiar with them than I am. But basically, we've got a bunch of squares here that have a series of different colored edges. And these are supposed to uh, self-assemble according to the local rule that uh, edges of the same color uh, are, are, are uh, abut one another. And what you can see, this is actually a calculation. Uh, the way it works is this is a, supposed to uh, represent the summation of 5 plus 9 coming to 14. So the calculation starts off over here. Go, runs down over the, down this diagonal until it meets this uh, pathway. This tile is then inserted because it fits in over there. That changes the direction coming over to here. When it meets the 9 uh, thing, then it comes up here to the 14 tile. So this, uh, and, you know, this, this type of self-assembly apparently is, is emulates the operation of a Turing machine. Now, you can think of this as a calculation, or you can think of it as an algorithmic assembly. This is uh, six long and 14 across, uh, forget the last row, column. And if I were going to make this pattern using the sort of no, uh, methodology I was talking about, it would take 84 tiles. But in fact, it wouldn't take 84 tiles. It would only take, to make exactly this pattern, 23 tiles. These 16 plus these would all have to be unique over here. Uh, and this is an algorithmic st uh, style of assembly. And, and that notion was originally promulgated by Eric Winfrey. And, you know, his idea was very simple, to take the kind of branch DNA molecules with sticky ends that we were using in our system and have them emulate um, uh, uh, Wang tiles. Uh, so in the example I'm going to show you, which is a one-dimensional example, we're just going to do cumulative XOR. So XOR, as probably all of you know, is uh, just a, a simple logic gate. If the inputs are the same, uh, 0 and 0, 1 and 1, you get zeros. If they're different, you get ones. And we're going to do a cumulative XOR, which means we just daisy chain these for about four. And the tile that we're going to use is this TX tile that has this red reporter strand in it. That becomes important as we, as we go on to do the calculation. Uh, now, I showed you this slide earlier. This was our four tile uh, two dimensional assembly. Now, what happened here was that. Uh, the correct tiles, say this red tile over here, was competing against incorrect tiles for its slot. Okay, so you, the right one never had much trouble finding its right slot, and there were no errors that we de ever detected in these arrays. So it's correct tiles competing against incorrect tiles. Now the tiles we're going to use in the XOR calculation and in pretty much any algorithmic assembly don't have that character. So the tiles used here were input tiles over here. So these, this is either a 1 or a 0. Uh, uh, these are initiators. You'll see how that works in a moment. But these are the calculation tiles, the four different uh, possible inputs, 0 and 0, 1 and 1, 1 and 0, 0 and 1. And those numbers are based on the sticky end, which I'm showing you again ge geometrically. And if you look over here, this is a one over here. Let's say the correct tile is this tile, okay, the one and one tile. But we have a one over here. We also have a one over here of exactly the same structure. And on the other end, we have this is the one over here. We have this one over here, there. So that the correct tile, this one, is competing against two half correct tiles. That's much more difficult chemistry. All right, now we, we got this to work pretty well here. So what you're going to see here, this is the assembly. We have longer sticky ends on the input tiles and the initiators. 
and then that creates a, a slot for this first tile, so it's a one. And then for the second position, it's one and zero, so we'll get another one in there. One and one will give us a zero. Zero and zero will give us another zero. So this thing actually works. To get the answer out, we ligate this red strand that goes all the way out here. So it's actually four tiles out here and four tiles out here, and the initiators, and they're all connected. And then there, if it's a one, it's got a restriction site for one enzyme and a zero for a different enzyme. Then we can just read the uh, answer off the gel, 1100, zero, zero, just like I just told you. Now, uh, 2D algorithmic assembly was eventually done uh, by, by Winfrey and his colleagues, Paul Rodman and Nick Papadakis. Uh, but it, wasn't done, it, it was done, but it wasn't really successful. You can see all these little red Xs and so forth, where uh, they, they made a Sierpinski triangle, but there are a number of errors there for exactly the reasons that I was telling you about. Uh, we've tried to address that problem shown here by inserting devices uh, to program a pattern, and this is work done by Hang Zhou Gu and uh, Ji Cho in my lab. So the idea was the following. We would sync these two devices into an array. So the array is down here. And depending on how we program these guys, we, remember this is that same JXPX device I showed you before, we would have either green on top, red, dark red on the bottom, a magenta on top, blue on the bottom, or some other combination. So here we have PX and PX. So that's uh, tile one would go in, tile two would go into the JXJX, the uh, JXPX would give us tile three, and the PXJX would give us tile four. Uh, what we signed them into was what's known as DNA origami. This is something Paul Rodman came up with in 2005 or 6. And it consists of a huge long strand, 7,500 nucleotides, 7,500 units, that is f designed to form a given shape, in this case, a hexagon with two right angles. And it's held in shape by what are called these little staple strands over here. Here's a larger version of that. And it's, it, it works remarkably well. So you just throw in these two, about 200 of these little strands in with this long strand, and you get uh, the shape you wanted. So Paul was well known for making a square, a rectangle, a star. He was best known for making a smiley face of DNA and a couple of other structures as well. Uh, so we used that same uh, device to make this particular origami with two slots in it. You can see a, a, a notch in the thing so we know which way is up. And then we added in those two devices, which could be programmed to be either in the PX state or the JX state in both cases. So there are four possible things that we could capture, depending on the four different states in which we put these two devices. A triangle pointing up, a triangle po down, up, a double a diamond, or a linear feature. And this is an example of the triangle pointing down. This is the triangle pointing up. Uh, this is the diamond. And this is a linear, fe linear feature. So the question is, how do you know I'm not cherry picking? All right. How, how do you know I just didn't say, OK, got one of those. Put it on the, on the AFM picture. Uh, the answer is, we went through an algorithm where, or, or a protocol where we were actually able to figure out what to do to get the right answer every time. And it was the following. We would add a pop possible capture molecule. Uh, and what happened, we found, was that the correct molecules bound. Half correct molecules also bound, but at least we didn't have to worry about the incorrect molecules. So we got rid of uh, one third of the wrong molecules. We would then heat and add the next molecule. And what would happen is the correct molecules would displace the half correct molecules, and the correct molecules were not displaced by either half correct or incorrect molecules. So in fact, the system actually worked, and we can repeat this for all species and get the right answers. Uh, and one other thing I want to show you about DNA computation from our lab was work done by Gang Wu uh, with the help of Natasha Janoska, where we solved a little graph theory problem with a three colorability issue. So here's a little graph, and the question is, is this three colorable? Can you uh, color each of the vertices in such a way that uh, no edge is flanked by the same color? Well, this is the answer over here. You can see it in DNA. So we have branch junctions in each of the positions of these guys. But of course, what we did was we programmed each of the junctions. So there wasn't just a red one in this position. There was also a blue one and a green one that, we could, that could have gone in here. Each uh, edge 
consisted of a long section that sort of said, OK, I'm red, and I'm this particular junction. And then in the middle, uh, it said, I'm, I'm red or I'm blue in the middle. And then I'm this particular junction, so I talk to uh, my mate over here or my mate over here or here. And then if we had the same color, we would create a restriction site that could be cleaved by a restriction enzyme. So here was the correct answer showing the, the three color ability of, of the graph. And here what is what happened when we only threw in, or you fixed two, you fixed two vertices always, this one, that one. And we threw in only one other color, and, we, and then two other colors, and then all three. And then on this, oops, come on, come back. Here we go. On this gel, we could see that when we threw in the restriction enzymes, we destroyed the one with one color, we destroyed the one with two colors, but this one remained. It's very faint because there are 81 different strands there, and only one set of those actually survived. But it, it, it did work. So we were able to establish the three color ability of this graph. Uh, now I want to go back to DNA nanotech and just uh, talk about one last story, which is combining multiple components. Uh, this is a macroscopic version of combining multiple components in a, nanomechanic, in a mechanical device. So this is a self-opening umbrella. And the way it works is you start off with rain, and that causes the sponge to expand when it gets wet. That hits the lever, that, hits the, that moves the thumb down to hit the striker wheel. That then lights the candle. The candle boils the water in the kettle. When the kettle is boiling, the whistle blows. When the whistle blows, the monkey jumps onto the uh, trapeze, and he swings back and forth, and that cuts the string that holds this helium-filled balloon in place, and it rises, opening the door to this cage, and there's a little bird attached to every one of the ribs of the umbrella, and they fly in different directions, and that opens the umbrella and keeps the guy dry. Now, this is a little more efficient than the things we've been able to do so far, but <laughs> we're, st we're, still work we're still working on that. All right, what we have done is make a proximity-based programmable nanoscale assembly line, work done by Hangzhou Gu and Ji Zhao again. Uh, the components that we're going to combine are a PXJX2 cassette, sort of like what we're used to from their other work, uh, a clocked walker, but this is going to be a somersaulting walker, not an inchworm, uh, nanoparticles, and DNA origami, with which you're already familiar. So this is an assembly line from uh, about 90 years ago, and we're, it, it's in Detroit. And what they're doing is they're making a car. So there are three key components here. There's directable assembly, the most important thing, the worker who knows what he's doing is going to attach something to this chassis rolling through the assembly line. We have a conveyor system here that's going to roll us along. And then we have a framework, the factory, that's going to hold everything in place in, in a reference system. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to replace the assembler with a PXJX2 cassette. It's programmable. The interstation conveyor is going to be our trigonal walker. It's just going to be that 10 segregate triangle we did the crystal structure of, but a little longer arms. And the framework will be a DNA origami. Uh, so this shows the uh, assembly of a, uh, a, a system where we're going to add every possible component to this potential chassis, i.e., this walker. What you see in this line in schematic, and this row in schematic, is shown over here in AFM. So we have three stations where we can add things, a 5 nanometer particle, a pair of coupled 5 nanometer particles, or a 10 nanometer particle. And uh, right now, all three of those are in the off position. As we, in the first step, we'll change the state of this one to the on position. And then by proximity, I'll show you how that works later, we actually add the 5 nanometer particle over here. And you can see how this has moved down. Then, uh, we take a half step and a whole step to position ourselves under the second, uh, second uh, station. Then we'll do the same thing. We'll change the state of this guy and add the second one, the pair of 5 nanometer particles. You can see that over here. Then we're going to take a half step and a whole step and position ourselves under the third uh, station. And then we'll do the same thing. We'll change the state of this guy, move him down over here, and add this one, and release the, 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 the product. Uh, the walker itself has three hands for grabbing the cargoes, H1, H2, and H3, and three feet for walking, F1, F2, and F3, and a fourth foot that keeps it oriented towards the uh, loading station. And this is a slightly more chemical picture of that same th set of uh, that same walker. Uh, this just shows how the transfer takes place. Uh, we have a, a, a toehold sitting over here that attacks H1. 
hydrogen bonds to over this position, and then this uh, displaces the, uh, the rest of it, so it's over here. It doesn't look like it so well in this picture, but more hydrogen bonds are over here than over there, and forming more hydrogen bonds provides the thermodynamic driving force for each of these reactions. Uh, we can program this thing to make a diversity of products depending on whether we program these three uh, stations to be in the off state or the on state where they're going to add to the, uh, the walker. So we can add nothing. We can add only the 5 nanometer particle, only the para 5s, or only the 10. We can add only the para 5s and the 5, the 10 and the 5, or the 10 and the pair. Or what I showed you in detail is add all three to the walker. Uh, this just shows the end of the walk for all eight possible products. This just shows the eight possible products. And this shows TEM pictures, transmission electron microscopy, showing the nanoparticles for all of these cases and that we made them in every case. Uh, to summarize what we've talked about here, we have polyhedral catenate. I didn't talk about knots and bromine rings. We can make them too. Can be assembled from branch DNA by ligation. Uh, 2D lattices with tunable features have been made from uh, DNA tile. I didn't talk about origami components. We've done that too. Uh, 3D crystals with tunable properties have been self-assembled and their structures have been determined. Heterologous species like the nanoparticles have been included in DNA nanoconstructs. There was more of that I didn't have time to tell you. Algorithmic assembly has been prototyped. At least one of its problems has been addressed. Uh, nanomechanical devices have been assembled from branch DNA, including shapeshifters and walkers. These have been combined on origami surface to produce a nanoscale assembly line. Uh, there are a lot of students always in the audience, and uh, I just and often they ask me, you know, what should I be studying if I'm interested in doing this? Well, obviously, math, computer science, and physics, and biophysics, and crystallography and chemistry and, bio, and biophysics, we didn't mention that, and biochemistry, uh, and biology. But that's not all, all right? This is uh, the, a, a picture from the floor of the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. And if you look closely, this is exactly like that first picture I showed you, where I took four branch junctions and put them together to make a quadrilateral. If you look closely, you'll see that, indeed, it's a double helix. There are two different colors here. I didn't even have to flip the slide to get it to be right-handed. Uh, so in addition to all the other things that you have to uh, learn, uh, don't forget art. It's really, very useful. Finally, I have to thank the people who paid for this work over the years, NIGMS, ONR, uh, NSF, briefly DARPA, ARO, uh, briefly the Keck Foundation, uh, a belly up company, and uh, DOE as well. There's my web page. It's not quite up to date. I hope to update it this summer. Uh, but you can find out everything you need to find out from that. So thank you very much. Yeah, here's a question. This is a, this is a can you do yeah. Nice. Yes, is the answer. Can you do some kind of finite cellular automaton? Can you do kind of like Can I do? Godway's game of life. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, I, th I think that's, that's certainly possible. That's sort, that's sort of uh, where we were starting, uh, where Eric was starting in his uh, uh, work with the Wong tiles, in fact. I mean, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how far we could get, but it's certainly that's possible. Yes? Have you tried to do tendrils like tiles? We're working on that as we speak. Uh, that's a little hard, uh, but uh, we're, it's, it's certainly uh, something that we're very interested in doing. We're also very interested in getting it supported by somebody. <laughs> so the answer is yeah. Uh, and we're thinking of, and, and of course in 3D, those are quasi-crystals, so we're very interested in uh, doing that type of thing. Yes? That's really, really cool stuff. Um, Thank you. I might have missed this because of my area. Maybe I missed it. But, uh, I just want to say, what, like, what speed do the walkers go at? Or what, what I'm sorry? What's, what is the speed of the walkers? Oh, OK, so that, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. And the answer is, it depends how you ask the question. If you're asking, I mean, most of what we do, uh, virtually everything we do, is done as a, uh, as in an ensemble. So we have a whole bunch of molecules that we're looking at. Uh, the, the walker that I showed here 
was analyzed by cross-linking and, you know, so we, we would let these things go for, you know, two, three, four hours, make sure that we had, had got everybody over whatever barriers were there as best we could. If you ask the question from a single molecule uh, perspective, uh, it's reasonably quick, but, you know, that's like this one sort of quick and the next one might be kind of slow and it's... I, I have no idea. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, I, I mean, really quick would, would be of the order of seconds. Uh, to getting everybody to go over the uh, hump would be of the order of 20 to 30 minutes, maybe more. Bernie, Bernie Yerke, when in, in the first device he made that was sequence-specific programmable, uh, was in, showed a curve that looked like that, where, like in, where the ex complete extent of the curve was something like 20 or 40 minutes, I forget. And 90% of it was gone after uh, about the first uh, 100 seconds or something. And then you were waiting uh, the, the next 1,000 uh, seconds or so for the last 10%. So you don't know, you know, what one, of the, one of the facts of life is we work with synthetic DNA. All this DNA is synthetic. And there are some errors uh, occasionally in that. You don't know whether you're slow doing these things because, in fact, you have to get over a hump be caused by some error in the deprotection of the molecule or something like that. So, uh, so the answer is time is a, is a hard thing to estimate in, in, in these cases. But, you know, reasonably quick. Uh, the, I, think, I think we spent uh, probably about three, four hours on, on, uh, per step on the, uh, on the assembly line just to make sure we, we had it all. Yes. Have you tried to make four-legged walkers that would allow more interesting gates? Oh, uh, we haven't done four-legged walkers yet. Uh, there, there is another system that Milan Stojanovic has done, where the walkers basically uh, are DNA zymes that eat a field of DNA grass, effectively, and they are they are four four-legged species, I believe. Was the assembly your initial ultimate uh, goal, or...? Well, our, our, our initial goal was to solve the crystallization problem. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it, it was obvious, even back in the late 70s, early 80s, that all the other uh, hurdles in the course of solving three-dimensional biological structures were computational and instrumental, and they were going to be solved relatively soon and by other people. And uh, this was the one problem that nobody uh, was really addressing in, in an out-of-the-box way. I mean, you know, today mostly it's done by robotics and whatnot, and, but it's still trial and error, and trial and error I find offensive. So, <laughs> yes? Have you made any non-orientable surfaces like Mobius bands or flat bottles? I haven't made a, Mo a Mobius strip, but one of my former students, Hao Yan, has. Uh, so yeah, that's doable. Uh, it's just a matter of but no Klein bottles. Yeah. No, he's made something pretty close, but it's not quite a Klein bottle. No. <laughs> okay, we can, if you can give me another dimension, I'm sure we can do it. 